Last Sunday we discussed John 12 when Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem for the Passover. It's when a, Greek, a, set of, a group of Greeks asked to see Jesus, and so we know it's a pivotal moment. John says Jesus used an important phrase when he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Since the NRSV and the Orthodox Jewish Bible translate that ancient Hebrew words, those ancient Hebrew words, both son and humankind, John's saying that the world's greatest deliverer will be the son of humankind. But there's more. Centuries earlier, before Jesus, Daniel had said that the Son of Man will rescue Israel and the world from those powers that had ruled with an iron fist, with violence and fear for centuries, the Babylonians and Assyrians, Medes and the Persians and the Romans. These people have been so cruel and savage and sadistic that writers describe them with images worse than wild beasts. Daniel says they're like one, a lion with eagle's wings, or a bear with three ribs and its teeth, or a leopard with four wings and four heads, or a beast with iron teeth and ten horns. Things like we'd see in an Alfred Hitchcock novel or a Stephen King movie, those images were frightening symbols in common in Daniel's day. But Daniel 7 envisions a new power coming into the world. After explaining that the giant beasts of fear and mayhem had been slain or defeated, Daniel says, I looked to see their dominion had been taken away because the one who came with the clouds of heaven was a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days, which means God, and was given dominion and glory and everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, a kingdom that shall not be destroyed. John is begging us in his gospel to see that Jesus is the son of man. Later that Passover week, Jesus would sit at a table with those disciples and say, do this often and remember me. So this new power entering the world means the days of savagery and inhumanity, of cruelty and terror are gone. That a new day has dawned when the Son of Man reigns because heaven has finally exerted its dominion over creation. What a confident word of hope Daniel offered. But as we mentioned last Sunday in that Passover of John 12, Israel forgot about Daniel. They missed the Son of Man standing right in front of them. They'd gotten lost in the crowds. Even when the voice of God spoke for them to hear, they thought it was just thunder. But dear friends, we come here to the table of Holy Communion so we can remember. In remembrance of me, this bread. In remembrance of me, drink this wine. So what's all this got to do with the 21st century and Lent? Well, in modern terms, it's like a few years ago when Matthew McConaughey was a guest speaker at a graduation for the University of Houston. Matthew gave students 13 things to help them start life well when they flipped their tassel. Now, 13 things to graduating seniors probably sounded like thunder. But his last one was good. I believe it's the goal of Lent. I've watched Matthew do a few things and heard a few things he said. He might could use some more filters, but he seems to have a good heart and refers often to a faith-based life. Oh, McConaughey's last advice to those seniors was, he said his goal in life is to get what I want to align perfectly with what I need. The what I want things are those things driven by desire, passions, typical pursuits of the moment. The what I need things are driven by deeper commitments, intentional promises, decisions I make that I do carefully so I don't regret. I also said Sunday that Sylvie and I saw that crowd in Chicago celebrating St. Patrick's Day. The ways they celebrate weren't as holy as the saints we might picture, but it was about a good saint. History doesn't really know the exact timing, but sometime in the late 400s, a teenage boy was captured and sold into slavery in Ireland. The boy had gone from living in a civil and a Christian family to being a slave among brutal pagans who treated him badly, neglecting things like proper food and clothing. In those darkest and ugliest years, the only thing that sustained him was what he learned about God in the first 12 or 14 years of his life. In the dark days, he opened his life to God. God was so integral that even in slavery, he was transformed. And when he finally escaped, he went to a monastery, surrendered his life to become a priest. He felt called to be a missionary priest and knew God was calling, to, calling him to a strange place, back to Ireland, where he'd been a slave. But this time, he went as an ordained minister. He later became the Bishop of Ireland. His name was Patrick, St. Patrick. And if St. Patrick was famous for anything as much as being the patron saint of Ireland, 
It is that he took the existing ideas of the culture in Ireland's Celtic culture, where we get the term Celtic or Celtic, and he made it our message. Celtic Christianity, like St. Patrick, was very devout. So instead of celebrating St. Patrick's Day today, cheering for a Boston basketball team or drinking a green beer, try to celebrate it the way the original Celtic Christians did in Ireland, or maybe the way that Patrick himself did, always aligning what you want with what you need. Because what you need always aligns with what God wants, and when you do what God wants, your needs, your wants, your everything will be fully satisfied. This Lent, follow Jesus closely, and remember. In remembrance of me, heal the sick. In remembrance of me, feed the poor. In remembrance of me, open the door and let your bride. song.